Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our Bible class uh, today as we tackle another episode uh, of Easter in the Old Testament. Uh, this is session three, I believe, and uh, today we are going to um, take a look at the story of Jonah. Uh, Jonah, an Old Testament prophet and a well-known story. I'm sure you're familiar with the outlines of it. And we want to think about what does Jonah and the story of Jonah and his experience teach us about the resurrection of Jesus and what that resurrection of Jesus means to us. Not only where do we see Jesus in the story, but where do we see ourselves? So at this time, we're going to do our little uh, uh, pause. I'd like you to go ahead and um, find uh, Jonah in the Old Testament, short book, only uh, four chapters. And we're only really going to deal with two of those chapters. But uh, rather than have me read here uh, in the Bible class on the video, uh, just go ahead and get your Bible out and read Jonah chapter 1 and 2. Pretty short, only about uh, oh, um, 27 verses or so total. So pause the video now, uh, read uh, Jonah chapter 1 and 2, and uh, we'll get started in just a second. All right, we're back. So um, let's start out um, in Jonah chapter one, and uh, we're just going to read the first three verses, and this kind of sets up the story. Uh, and here it is, Jonah one. I am going to read these, Jonah one, one through three. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So the first thing in the story of Jonah, um, the sort of the prelude uh, to the resurrection and the deliverance of God is that it teaches about sin and rebellion. Uh, this sets up resurrection, doesn't it? Uh, Jonah is in rebellion against God. God has commanded Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh. Uh, Jonah does not want to do this. Uh, he disobeys. And being in a state of rebellion, disobedience, what we would call being in a state of active, sort of, not sort of, active sin, he tries to run away from God tries to flee from the presence of God. And right away, we can see ourselves in this story uh, because we, as sinners, are in rebellion against God. We are uh, sinners and we do the same thing as Jonah. We try to run away. This is the um, always the stance of sinners. We think of Adam in the garden uh, when he and Eve had eaten the fruit of the tree and uh, uh, the Lord God comes and uh, in the garden and asks Adam, where are you? And Adam is hiding uh, because he was afraid of God. Uh, Jonah and we and Adam, when we sin, the presence of God becomes a terror to us. The presence of God in and of itself is not a terror. Uh, God is a God of love uh, and giving. But when we set ourselves up in rebellion against that God, uh, we flee as Jonah does. It says... Uh, he rose to flee from the presence of the Lord. We try to run away from God because to come into the presence of God as a sinner um, is a terrible thing. Um, and so Jonah runs away. Step two in the Jonah story and in our story as we are headed towards resurrection is the pursuit of God. If, if uh, the first act is rebellion and sin, uh, step two is God's pursuit. God doesn't let Jonah just go off. God pursues him. Uh, he pursues Jonah and us. And his object uh, is repentance. Now, for Jonah, it's a storm. The very next verse says, The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Jonah was on this ship 
with lots of other people. And God sends this storm after Jonah. And what he's doing is he's trying to get Jonah to turn around, to realize his sin, to cease, and to come back to him, to come back to abandon his sin. This storm is a storm of God's pursuit. It's the storm of God's displeasure over sin. And for us, God sends the same thing. He sends a storm. He pursues us. This is quite frightening, and it's supposed to be frightening. We call this, in our Lutheran lexicon, the preaching of the law. The law bears down on us. When we are in sin and rebellion, God points out that sin. He pursues us. He condemns us. He threatens us. Uh, this law can come in preaching. It can come when we hear the scriptures. Our guilty conscience can call out to us. The circumstances of our life, all of it is can be God's law telling us, hey, turn around, you're doing wrong, you're sinning. And, and in this threatening, in this storm, God is wanting us to come to our senses, to turn around. We think of the prodigal son in the Gospel of Luke, the parable, when he went out, threw away all his money, was there feeding the pigs, and the story says, one day he came to his senses, his circumstances, had convinced him, this was God's preaching of the law, that he was in, a, in, in sin and rebellion and he ought to return home to his father. And here it is, Jonah 2. God sends this storm, which is actually, in the end, an expression of God's love. This storm is meant to get Jonah back to him. But to do it, he has to wake Jonah up. He has to threaten him to the very core of his being. Um, uh, and we call this the preaching of the law. That's what the storm was. So step three is, ultimately, Jonah in the state of rebellion has to undergo a transformation. It's not simply that Jonah has to do better, be a better person, stop sinning, uh, you know, improve himself. But Jonah in the state of rebellion and sin ultimately must be put to death. He must die and rise again. He must be... Uh, go under and be born again. It's not simply enough for Jonah to do a self-improvement program, but he has, to, he has to be thrown overboard, which is exactly what happens. He has this long conversation with the sailors, and ultimately he confesses to them that he is the reason for the storm, and they throw him overboard. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. We too don't need simply moral improvement. If it was enough, if we could do it, if we could stop our sinning, if we could improve ourselves, then we'd have no need for Jesus. But what we need, the ultimate solution to our sin problem, is transformation, death. Our old Adam, our old sinful person must be put to death, not tamed, not domesticated, but put to death, thrown overboard, die, in order that that old person be done with and a new person rise again. Our sin is that great, right? And here's where we start. So number three here, and you know, uh, we need a death. We need to be put to death. This is ultimately what God is pursuing, to put us to death. Jonah is thrown overboard. And here we get to begin to see, in this story, Jesus. Because Jonah is thrown overboard, put to death. We die too, we are put to death, but we are put to death in Christ. In Christ. Because Christ comes and is thrown overboard for us. God's wrath, God's storm is raging, and Jesus comes in our place, in our flesh, and he is thrown overboard on the cross. He is thrown into the great raging storm of God's wrath. And he absorbs that wrath on the cross. He takes it upon himself. And we, in Christ, with Christ as our sacrifice and our substitute, we are baptized into Christ. And Romans 6 says that we are baptized into Christ. We are buried with him, therefore, into death. When Christ dies, we are put to death too. 
our old sinful Adam is put to death, so that we too may rise and walk in newness of life. In Christ we are buried into death, and we rise again with him. This is forgiveness. This is resurrection. Not just a pardoning, not just moral improvement, but death and resurrection. Now, spiritual death, not talking about uh, in the, when we die and uh, when Jesus comes back, that too, of course, is true. But even now, right now, we die and our rise again when we come to faith, when we are Christians. God gives resurrection to Jonah. He throws himself overboard. He's thrown overboard. But then God sends the great fish to swallow him. Verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It is, of course, here you see that the water for Jonah is death. It's drowning. The fish is salvation in this part of the story. Uh, the fish saves him. And here we get an explicit connection to the story of Jesus. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And Jesus picks up on this. And Jesus himself says that the story of Jonah is a sign, a picture, a type, which points to him. He says it in Matthew chapter 12. And if you want to pause your, uh, the video and look this up, uh, please feel free. I'll stop here just for a moment. Okay, um, Matthew 12, really verse uh, 39 and 40, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jonah's experience is a picture which points to Jesus' experience. Um, three days and then resurrection. Next part in this story after uh, Jonah's uh, three days and three nights is Jonah's prayer in chapter 2. It's a wonderful prayer. It's a psalm really written as a Hebrew psalm. And in this prayer, Jonah realizes he's helped. He cannot save himself. He is being put to death. To be put to death spiritually is to realize that you are helpless, that you cannot improve yourself, that you cannot save yourself, that you cannot be righteous enough. Right? When you're dead, you can do nothing. Right? And Jonah realizes it and expresses it in his prayer. Out of the belly of the Sheol, of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. Uh, he's in the heart of the sea. The flood surrounds him. I'm driven away from your sight. All your waves and billows passed over me. The waters closed in over to me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. That is Jonah experiencing being put to death. And yet, this being put to death, God's pursuit of him, which has put him to death, thrown him in the water, all of that pursuit is for the sake of this that he would save Jonah. Once Jonah has given up, once Jonah has been crushed, once Jonah has been put to death, God saves him. God resurrects him. That's the kind of God he is. This is why we are saved by grace, not by what we do, but by the fact that we can do nothing. And once we have done nothing, we realize that once we're at nothing, dead, God resurrects us. And Jonah says, you brought my life up from the pit. Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And he says at the end of this psalm, salvation belongs to the Lord. Only God can give salvation, not us. Resurrection is salvation. And he praises, Jonah praises the Lord and the Lord gives him life. In this psalm of Jonah, we can also hear the voice of Jesus um, being forsaken by God. If you remember in the Gospels, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when uh, we hear the psalm of Jonah in chapter 2, we can hear the voice and the experience of Jesus uh, experiencing our own sin, God's judgment on sin, and the separation from God that Jesus experiences on the cross. And yet God gives him also, and he is risen from the dead. 
uh, uh, salvation, um, victory over death and over sin. Finally, the conclusion to the Jonah story is that death cannot hold Jonah. The fish, which has saved him from the water, but he still must be released from the fish, which holds him. Verse 10 of chapter 2, the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Death could not hold Jonah because God had decided and knew to save him. Because God was a God of love, pursued him with his stormy wrath, cast him into the water, resurrected him, and God commanded the fish, and the fish vomited him out of dry land. Jonah has then thus been resurrected, born again. Death could not hold Jesus. The fish, the watery deep, is a picture of the death in which Jesus goes into death, but because he is the Son of God, because he's the innocent one given for the guilty, and he takes away sin, death cannot hold him. Death must release him. Jesus' resurrection is this vomiting out onto dry land. It's a, it's a gross image, but the one that points exactly to Jesus' victory over death. Death can't hold him. And the same is true of us. Both now, sin cannot hold us, spiritual death can't hold us, because we've been baptized into Christ. We have been buried with him by our baptism, and we are risen again. Death cannot hold us. And when death comes to claim us again at the end of our life, it will not be able to hold us. What we have in store for us, it, because we belong to Jesus, because we are in Christ, when we go down into death, the same thing will happen to us that happened to Jesus. And that is, death will vomit us up because we belong to Christ and God will spe speak to the fish, speak to death, and it will release us and it will vomit us up into eternal life. To heaven, the moment we die, we're in the presence of Christ. And when Christ returns, our bodies also will be released from the earth uh, into that new age, the resurrection. So that's Jonah. I hope you enjoyed that one. We went quickly. Uh, Easter in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll be back soon with another episode. God's peace be with you. Amen.